A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him.
Dominus Vobiscum, et cum spiritu tuum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam, Gloria Ti, Piet Domine. Jesus' father and mother were amazed at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be contradicted, and you yourself a sword will pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Verbum Domini. A week ago, we had a feast of great joy in celebrating the nativity or the birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Today, we focus on the sorrows of Our Lady. And it was Pope Pius X that decreed that this feast be celebrated on September 15th. And we are reminded by the church in this memorial of the special union of Our Lady shared in the sacrifice of her son. And the words of Jeremiah the prophet can be applied to Our Lady as well in reference to the sufferings of her son. All you who pass by the way, look and see, was there ever a sorrow to compare with my sorrow? The Blessed Virgin Mary went through the horrific suffering of witnessing her son's violent death. 
And it's said that Our Lady's sorrow and anguish is even greater because of her holiness. The more a person loves another, the more they identify with the suffering of the one they love. And in the Gospel, we heard of the prophecy of Simeon, which shows that Mary's life will be closely associated with the redemptive work of her son. We heard, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be contradicted. And you yourself, a sword will pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So in this gospel, we get a glimpse of the sacrifice on Calvary, where our Lord's intense sufferings will greatly affect Our Lady, His Mother, as she will participate in His, suf- in his suffering. And the Catechism tells us that Mary was associated more intimately than any other person in the mystery of His redemptive suffering. And the suffering here is described as a sword that will pierce her heart, that will pierce her soul. And this is often depicted in statues or images of Our Lady of Sorrows with either a sword, one sword piercing her soul, or her heart, or seven swords piercing her heart. And the seven swords symbolizing the seven sorrows which Our Lady traditionally went through. And they're from Scripture. You have the prophecy of Simeon, which we just heard in the Gospel. The flight into Egypt, when St. Joseph and Our Lady took the child Jesus and fled to Egypt to avoid the persecution of King Herod, who was trying to murder the divine child. We have the loss of the child Jesus in the temple. And Mary meets Jesus on the way to Calvary with the cross. The crucifixion and death of our Lord. And when Jesus is taken down from the cross, this is often portrayed in the Pieta, or Our Lady holding the body of her son after he's taken down from the cross. And finally, the seventh sorrow is the burial of Jesus. And again, these sorrows show that Our Lady is united ever closer to her son in his suffering. And it was said by the spiritual writer Adolf Tankery, when the soldiers strike the body of Christ, it is as if Mary is subjected to every blow. When they pierce his head with thorns, Our Lady feels their sharp penetration. When the same men offer him gall and vinegar, the Blessed Mother tastes all the bitterness. As they spread his body on the cross, Mary is torn from within. And the church offers two options for the gospel in today's memorial, the one we just heard, which is the first sorrow or the prophecy of Simeon, and then the, the sorrow of Our Lady standing beneath the cross. And we just, this is reflected further in the sequence we heard after the responsorial song, the Stabat Mater, which means the mother stood. And that's more significant than we might think, the fact that she stood beneath the cross. It's noted that at one time, Rome was asked to establish a feast of Our Lady of the Swoon, which would commemorate her fainting or swooning before the foot of the cross. And the answer came back, no, we won't establish that. And a cardinal whom Pope Julius consulted about this explained in St. John's Gospel that Our Lady is described as standing, not fainting or swooning. He'd go on to say that if she had fainted, she would not have been able to remain constantly united to the sufferings of Christ. And Father David Liptak, in a book he wrote on Our Lady, on reflections on her life, notes how Pope Benedict XIV criticized artists and preachers who described Mary's sorrows and sufferings as having crushed her completely or brought her to her knees in despair. He went on to say that nothing in our Catholic tradition would support such a Marian depiction. Our Lady stood faithfully beneath the cross. And blessed John Henry Newman would likewise express that Mary did not grovel in the dust, but stood upright to receive the blows, the stabs, which the long passion of her son inflicted upon her every moment. So as we continue to celebrate this memorial of Our Lady of Sorrows, may we have recourse to our mother who intercedes for us in our sorrows and trials throughout this life, that she may draw us ever closer to her son.